Now, there might not be another more important topic as it relates to your habitat and hunting goals on your land than where your food plots are located. A poor location can kill you. A poor location won't set up any kind of doe bedding. If you don't have doe bedding, you don't have buck bedding. So it's critical how you locate food plots on your land as a base of where deer bed, let alone where you access and how you hunt. So it all has to come together and that's the first thing I look at when I go to client properties and when I'm on their land. I want to show you a diagram here. I'm going to make this just this concept right here. I want to talk about it. I'm going to draw it out. Then we'll go show you the actual client design and how it related to their land as far as where the food plots are, how it affected it, and how it really is going to up their ability just this year, just changing a few things and making some hard work happen. And uh, they'll increase their herd and their hunt this year just uh, several times the value that it is right now. So let me imagine a long rectangle parcel. In fact, this parcel is only um, approximately 32 acres. A long narrow piece up here and then a larger piece down here. Something like that. And so basically is the property outline, the house is over here. As of right now, this is where most of the cover is back here. All cover back on the side. So with the cover back there, it's really hard because you have this entire length right here, there's open ag, and it's really not helping the, the client out in any way. Not designating where deer are going or defining their daily use, where they're bedding, where they're feeding or anything. So a trick in a parcel like this, length is good because you can pull deer across the entire landscape and that sets up a lot of stand locations along the way, but you're not gonna do it with just cover. You have to have food. For example, there's open ag up here and there's hunting pressure down here. There's a highway right here. And right along that, that entire length, big highway on that on the east side. And so more houses here, more houses here, more houses here. So this area is really sandwiched into a small area. What I love about food plots is that they can represent a stopping point and a bottom of the funnel of daylight movement on your land and any land to where you're drawing deer out to a big giant food source, hold them on your land till dark, and then you're sending them off. This right here, right now they currently have the food right here, all the way in the back. So what that does is it creates a movement that's really just stretching into this area right here. Very short movement, They're not, there's not much depth to it, so they hold a bunch of does and fawns here, a bunch of does and fawns here. By the time they're down here, they're on the neighbor's property, and they're really not holding a lot of deer uh, for that on their own land. Instead, the most important thing to do is pull the food out here. Now we can't pull food on this side because there's a high hunting pressure and the FCRP. Not a lot of good grasses, but there's enough weeds in there with Phragmite that have grown up in the CRP to give the deer some cover. In the typical C CRP blend where it had big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, it's all laying down there. I was in January and the landowner said there's not much cover there during the fall, but they do move around here. There's pockets of Phragmite out here that hold some deer, especially as you get back towards the waterway. There's also a river right here all the way through. So I don't want that food to be on this side because you're going to place deer into the Phragmite pockets down here. So I want that food to be up here. I want deer to relate to this movement. So large food up on this side, little food to direct movement this way, trail plot more. And, and then the real important step in all of this outside of the food is we have to have cover out here, so we're adding switchgrass and then diversity pockets of early successional growth within the switchgrass, and you'll see that on the, on the actual client drawing, where within that drawing, there's pockets in there. It'll represent 50% of the area in early successional growth pockets, non-grass because you wanna have daytime browse, and those early successional growth pockets will provide the daytime browse, while the switchgrass swallows it up and encloses that daytime browse so the deer could actually live there during the day. Instead of being here or down in these pockets, we expect to, to stack a lot of deer into this area right here. So by the time he gets back to a stand location here, here, or here, those are all buck batting areas all the time simply because we've pulled a lot of does. Here's a food source here. 
So we pulled a lot of does into this layer to bed. There's also opportunity for does to bed on the way back. And then by the time you get back here, then really this entire area could become buck bedding. And as we get closer to the ag up here, then this might become doe on this edge right here. And then really a solid area of bucks all the way back in here. So by pulling out that food, we've created the opportunity for buck bedding adjacent to the food and then created or doe bedding adjacent to the food and then buck bedding towards the rear back here. We actually have that depth, that, that parcel is a half mile deep. So very deep, skinny parcel. And because we have this whole assemblage right here, we've pulled deer out to here. We've given them a lot of room to just go right into the food source. Then after dark, they just go north into the ag, release them after dark. It's open ag fields up there. A lot of times it's sugar beets and they're there or beans and they're there up after dark. And then that's where they feed. A lot of deer right now are just crisscrossing through and going up to the ag. We'll be able to turn them left or right when they get onto my client property, whether they're coming from the south or the north, maximize the time that they're on the property. And because we have the food to one side and a lot of the cover to the other, that creates a lot of great stand locations where we have opportunity with a pop up in the grass right here for an evening stand as deer are moving into the food plots, evening stand right up here, evening stand as they're coming out of cover, morning stand where you can slip all the way along behind the switchgrass and, and access into a stand location. Really good cruising stands, morning stands on the back side here and down into here. Big pond down the bottom here, big waterway where the landowner can blow a scent into. These stands he can actually access from behind like this. Get into these stands, come into this way. So he really never has to get into this entire middle area all the way along. So because you're pointing this food to the one side, it re represents a stopping point where the deer cannot go. It's a dead end of movement where the deer aren't going to go past that location into his yard during the daylight or across the road or into the neighbor's yard. They're going to hole up in that switch grass with the big food plots. That's going to represent their daylight movement. And then again, that it creates that stand, that stand assemblage on that property. That's why that food location is so critical. So it makes sense. The more that food's back here, you destroy the movement, you destroy the depth, you destroy the ability to hold box and does on the property, you destroy the ability to have morning stands, evening stands, midday cruising stands. So that food location is critical in many respects. And forgot to mention across this whole north side for his access, he's got a ditch system with trees, switchgrass planted on the back side, and he can actually access along this row without spooking any deer on the food plots or any deer that are inside the switchgrass. The switchgrass aids in scent dispersion for hunters, helps soundproof his land, and of course it makes it so the deer can't see him going by. So switchgrass is a great tool for this. And the great thing is it'll be standing up all winter long. I was just there last week in uh, early February and it's standing up. He has some switchgrass back here that surrounded his original food plots, standing strong and proud. And um, I can't wait for him to put it together. And I want to show you what the client design now actually looks like on paper and how I drew, up, drew it up for this client. So you can actually see the stand locations, the green food source, the brown diversity pockets, and the yellow switchgrass, and how that all comes together. So this is a completed client drawing showing that location of the food and everything. I want to just go through the pieces. You can see the food right here. You can see a food plot trail. I want those deer. They're 40 yards, 50 yards in off the edge. I want them to relate parallel to the border. It's an original concept of mine, pushing those deer back and forth, keeping them off of the high hunting pressure land here down to the south. Open ag up here to the north, so really safe location to bring deer to in the afternoon. Houses along a road right here, so it's a stopping point. They're coming to that point and then exiting to go to the field to the north. So really putting the pieces together, starting with the food. You can see the brown little pockets in here, army green, as my client on Saturday referred to. But those areas, early successional growth pockets, we're going to have a separate video on how to convert an old field for wildlife. And this is one of those ways. In those areas, you can plant pollinators of flowers and forbs and forages for uh, butterflies, birds, bees. Could also have a lot of food value in there for rabbits, pheasant, and then of course whitetails. So it's not just all about the whitetails. This, this client right here is going to just have a huge area of wildlife on his land. 
Switchgrass is so critical, just about as important as the food plot because that hides the entire food plot and it hides all those diversity pockets within where you expect the wildlife to live. You can notice more solid switchgrass around the outsides. So that allows my client to get back and forth on his south border. There's a ditch line right here. He can get back and forth on his north border. And then he can get into the land right here. And by the time he gets back there, that's where he's going to experience a lot of bucks. All the way in the back back here. So once he's back here, right now the food plots are right here. That creates an incredibly short movement with not a lot, a lot of cover. And of course it throws deer on the neighbors right here because they really don't have anywhere else to go. So by pulling that out, it elongates the movement. These food plots are in a very linear fashion so we can stick those right against them. Another original concept of mine where instead of having one big food source and attempting to stack deer right behind it and don't putting does on top of does, we're allowing them to bed in a linear fashion so that they can stack up against the food where they want to be. They might have some does back in this, right, in this location right here, but by the time you get back in here and you have some dedicated bedding cuttings, a couple hunting plots back here that he can, he can access very easily, then this is how you put all the pieces together on a property using the foundation of food, which establishes doe bedding opportunity, buck bedding back here that establishes morning stands, waiting for bucks to come in back here, evening stands as deer are moving out of cover and into food, and then these midday funnel areas where you can expect deer to be moving, especially bucks, back and forth from the cover into those remote areas of the cover, pushing does back into. So now this landowner, instead of having one or two stands back here that he couldn't figure out if it was morning, evening, no movement really defined within one to two years, and really, he'll, he should have 40 to 48 inch switchgrass this year. But within one to two years, he'll have a complete assemblage of morning stands, midday stands, evening stands, and he'll elongate that movement. He'll create a great opportunity for several times more deer on his land than he has right now, and a whole lot easier structure of stands and tree stand and hunting strategy to hunt those mature bucks that are coming in, especially towards the rear and in those buck bedding areas of the property.